The COVID-19 pandemic has affected us all in some way and cyber criminals did not lose any time in leveraging the situation. As a result, the entire cyber crime landscape has changed over the last few months. Not all the changes can be attributed to the pandemic, but many connections can be traced back to it. Getting to a new normal of life have been have we, be, well, we've, we've become more vulnerable than before and do we face new threats in cyberspace? A very warm welcome to Kaspersky's inaugural Asia Pacific Online Policy Forum on Cyber Resilience in the New Normal, Risks and New Approaches. We have 370 people who have registered for this forum and I'm excited to be your moderator today. I am Jeannie Gan, Head of Government Relations for Asia Pacific in Kaspersky. During the session, from different stakeholder groups' perspectives, we'll discuss existing and emerging risks in cyberspace and possible solutions to address them. We'll also explore challenges and limitations by discussing if we have sufficient resources to address existing risks and if the pandemic crisis has revealed new approaches in states' best practices to achieve cyber resilience. Feel free to ask any questions during the webinar. You may have noticed that all participants are muted from the start. You can type your questions into the questions panel and click send. It will be very helpful if you can indicate who the question is posed to. Your questions will only be seen by the organizer and it will be worth mentioning that the most interesting questions would be addressed first, but we'll do our best to address them nonetheless during the forum, time permitting. For those who would like to revisit today's discussion after the event, don't worry, a recording of the forum will be made available to all who have registered for the forum. With that, I'm delighted to introduce our host of this forum, Mr. Eugene Kaspersky, Chief Executive Officer of Kaspersky, the world's largest privately held cybersecurity company that protects over 400 million users and more than a quarter million corporate clients around the globe. Eugene began his career in cybersecurity accidentally when his computer became infected with a cascade virus in 1989. His specialized education in cryptography helped him analyze the encrypted virus, understand its behavior, and then develop a removal tool for it. And in 1997, the company Kaspersky was founded. So today it operates in nearly 200 territories and employs more than 4,000 security specialists. The Kaspersky antivirus database is also one of the most comprehensive and complete collections in cybersecurity used in detecting more than 500 million malicious programs. And in the last 23 years, the company has experienced a lot and the entire cyberspace has changed dramatically. But this year teaches us to be prepared all the time to new challenges to quickly adapt and develop further. Some people see the pandemic crisis as a line between previous life and today's new norm, but is it so and what has changed? I'm happy to pass the floor now to Eugene for his opening remarks. Over to you, Eugene. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello everybody, I, uh, I'm Eugene Kaspersky and I want to thank you all for joining this event uh, and especially many thanks to our speakers who also are here uh, and uh, I will spend uh, just a few uh, minutes to introduce uh, uh, to describe the situation in the cyberspace and how do we come to see it. Well, uh, I don't want to spend time uh, to uh, explain how much the cyber changed the world. Uh, many of us and myself, uh, we still remember the world before cyber, so we are like a generation, uh, so we see the differences. Uh, and well, uh, honestly speaking, I wrote my first program when I was 15, uh, but anyway, I remember that world without cyber. And then the cyber came on our table, uh, to our pockets, uh, to uh, many other things, and sometimes we still even don't understand how much cyber is around us. Uh, it's everywhere, maybe most probably uh, in the elevator in your office, uh, in your car, um, everywhere, the, the power generators, the power, uh, power grids managed by, by cyber. So uh, cyber is everywhere around us. And unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the cyber technologies, uh, they are designed, um, well, in a traditional way, which is not secure, really secure. So that's why uh, there are so many hackers and so many bad guys 
which attack the cyber systems. And that's why the cyber security is uh, so important issue uh, right now. And especially in times of the COVID pandemic, because uh, the more people are online, because the more people they spend time at home, uh, the more uh, companies, more enterprises, uh, they uh, relocated employees home, so the employees they work from home, uh, and that makes for hackers uh, to have a more easy way how to attack the uh, the enterprise infrastructure. Unfortunately, we see the increase in hackers activity uh, during this uh, this time. Uh, and before COVID, uh, just few numbers. Before COVID, uh, we had uh, just uh, more than three hundred thousand new malicious application a day. So every day we collect, we were collecting more than 300,000 new unique malicious uh, files. Right now we collect more than 400,000. So we see the increase in more than 25% uh, of the hackers activity. Um, well, that, that's reality and that's why uh, during this uh, the COVID time the cybersecurity is getting even more important because the world now is more online. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, this is one of the main topics we're going to discuss today. Uh, and I hope that today's uh, meeting and today's discussion will be, well, quite uh, interesting. So thank you so much and enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Um, I think it is now time for me to introduce our three very distinguished panelists for today. Eugene is joined by three panelists who will be speaking together and taking questions later on. So first of all, I will like to introduce General Rajesh Pant. He is the National Cyber Security Coordinator at the Prime Minister's Office of the Government of India. General Pan is an internationally recognized cyber security expert and is responsible for coordinating all activities across multiple sectors to ensure a secure and resilient cyberspace within India. We also have with us Mr. David Koh, who is the Commissioner of Cybersecurity and Chief Executive of the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. Mr. Koh leads Singapore's efforts to provide dedicated and centralized oversight of national cybersecurity functions, and these include enforcing the cybersecurity legislation, strategy and policy development, cybersecurity operations, ecosystem development, public outreach and international engagement. Let me now introduce Ms. Mihoko Matsubara. Having previously worked at the Japanese Ministry of Defense, Mihoko is now Chief Cyber Security Strategist at Nippon Telegraph and Telephone Corporation, NTT Tokyo. She is responsible for cybersecurity thought leadership at NTT and is no stranger to international conferences as an invited speaker. We are 10 minutes into our forum and I think with introductions all in order, maybe it is time for me to call up the first poll question, which I'll like all audience involvement with. You would now see on your screen um, a website address, www.menti.com. If I can trouble everyone to please, all participants to key in that website address in your browser and to key in the code 2935201 to participate in the poll. The question is, what creates risks in cyberspace? We have got, well, five options. Vulnerabilities in technologies, cyber criminals, lack of cyber hygiene, laws and regulation and others. We'll give everyone a minute or two to put in the votes. For those who have just joined our forum, just to let you know that questions can be asked in the questions panel. It'd be really helpful if you indicate who your questions are posed to, and we'll try our best to have them addressed later on.
We'll give it another half a minute more for the poll question to be answered before we close it and maybe have a short discussion. Thank you very much to everyone who have expressed their views to our first poll questions of what creates risks in cyberspace. And um, I think it is a good time now, now that we see, I think our panelists also are having their eyeballs on the screen and observing which are some of the responses with more um, that are most popular. I think we are ready to dive into the panel discussion proper now with this opening the session. Um, and also as questions are slowly streaming into our questions pane, let me start by inviting Mr. Ko to maybe give some comments on whether you think and how have we become more cyber vulnerable since the pandemic greeted the world. Mr. Ko. Thanks very much, uh, GD. Um, hello to everyone from Singapore. I I just want to start by saying that uh, we are in the midst of a global pandemic, and COVID nineteen has fundamentally changed the way that we live, work, and play. I think this is a, a truism. It's obvious, and wherever we are in the world, I think the, the fact that we are meeting meeting this way uh, for a start underscores just how much our society has changed. Now, this has a huge impact on the way um, on cybersecurity. I think uh, just to start off and kick, kick things off, I'd say that there are two huge impacts. The first is that um, governments, uh, industry, individuals have had to fundamentally change the way that uh, we do things. Um, as I said, the way we live, the way we work, and even the way that we entertain ourselves. And all this in a very, very short space of time. So what that means is that companies have had to adapt to work from home arrangements. Uh, businesses have to now engage uh, on e-commerce. E Things which perhaps um, nine months ago we thought were too difficult to do, but literally overnight we have had to change. Change the way that uh, we engage with our customers, change the way that we transact business, change the way that government provides services. And for us as consumers, change the way that we uh, consume uh, the services and the uh, uh, products that uh, we need. What this means is that we have had to fundamentally adapt, uh, take up and, and uh, em employ new technologies literally overnight. Uh, this means that a lot of these new technologies are much less secure than the traditional systems that we used to have. Take, for example, the bank. Traditionally, you would do things in the bank and you have controls in place. Now, when the employees have to work from home, you have to extend the back room. You have to extend some of your databases out so that your employees can access this from their mm -hmm. environment. This changes your risk profile. This changes the attack surface that you have to deal with. The amount of controls that we used to have have changed literally overnight. And many of these are now less secure. Your network now spans through untrusted um, networks. You're, you're using people's uh, home Wi-Fi systems. These are not as secure as your enterprise office environment. The second big change is that the cyber criminals, the attackers have adapted as well. They are now focused on using COVID-19 pandemic uh, information as lures. Lures for scams, lures for ransomware attacks, lures for phishing emails. So whether you are trying to find out uh, the latest information on the pandemic or now as we are more interested in the vaccines, uh, these are things of high interest and the criminals have leverage on this. So these two dimensions have changed things and made us far more vulnerable, in my opinion, 
um, in the area of cybersecurity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ko. And just riding on what you just said, Mihoko, um, I'm going to call on you next to, to ask if you have the same observations on reasons for um, a marked rise and the, you know, the touch points in terms of COVID-19 related malicious cyber activity. Sure. So, uh, thank you, everybody. So, my name is Mihoko Matsubara from Tokyo, and thank you for having me. So, I totally agree with uh, Mr. Kaspersky and Mr. David Cole because the, the pandemic has totally changed our way of life and how to entertain ourselves and how to work. So, we spend more time online under the current situation because we, we have uh, travel constraints. And we are keen to report the latest information on the pandemic or the work situations. So the quick ratio on the phishing emails have gone up um, from less than 5% to over 40% before and after the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So this is a significant change. And the second reason why we became more vulnerable is because of the many organizations have shifted so abruptly to a remote work environment. And unfortunately, um, most of the organizations have not been able to embed cybersecurity into the remote work IT environment, or at least they should have provided a cybersecurity training for remote workers, but they haven't done that. And actually, in the Asia Pacific regions, 45% of organizations have not done that kind of training yet for their employees. So we have became more vulnerable. And third, because the current ongoing uh, recessions has made uh, more organizations to unfortunately cut their cybersecurity budget. And uh, in, as of in May 2020, Barracuda Networks found that 40% of global organizations have cut their cybersecurity budget. So because of these three reasons, I believe that we became more vulnerable to cyber attacks. All right. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. Um, I'm, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to ask the next question to General Pant um, and really tapping on you, sir, to speak from government's perspective while addressing the risks that um, the, the earlier speakers have, have sort of touched on. Should we focus on the technologies themselves or user behavior, which is the, the malicious use of technologies, um, which can heighten cyber vulnerability? What, what are your views? Well, firstly, uh, good afternoon to everyone in Asia Pacific. Dobro utro vsem v Moskve. And uh, thank you, Mr. Kaspersky for having me here. Um, uh, coming to uh, Jenny's question, let me uh, just uh, remind everyone that just three days back on 15th of August, when India was celebrating its uh, 73rd Independence Day, for the first time our Prime Minister in his address to the nation has made a mention of the importance of cybersecurity and the fact that we are very soon going to come out with a national cybersecurity strategy. So that is the level at which this issue has now been uh, raised. About a week back, the Australian cybersecurity was also released, and I'm aware that most nations around the world today have a strategy uh, to deal with the changing circumstances. And the changes have all been spoken about by Mr. David Ko also, by Ms. Mehoko also, as to how something that was to happen five years later has suddenly happened in five weeks. So to come to your question of the risks, as far as uh, the government sector is concerned, what we saw was a sudden rise in rise online, online usage. usage. So uh, we have an organization called the National Informatics Center or NIC, which handles the government sector. It handled earlier about 20 million emails per day. From 20 million, it went up to 70 million per day. That was one change. Secondly, the online financial transactions saw a steep rise. And only in one month, in the month of March, there were 50,000 new UPI handles that were created. UPI is our unified payment interface. So 15,000 people joined the payment system 
because these were the people i don't want to say were the laggards but they realized that there was no other option except to go in for the online payments in india actually the scale and size of everything is huge okay so <laughs> please, please i mean don't get surprised at the numbers when i talk of millions and thousands now uh, we are aware what has happened to cyber crime it's gone up by 600% uh, everything that ms mehoko has said is right about click baiting etc now what the government has done is that the government has very quickly adapted we've uh, come out with advisories for the uh, work from home environment we've uh, come out with advisories on the uh, video conferencing because initially there was a lot of talk about zoom bombing etc so now people are gradually becoming conscious as to how to create a waiting room how to have a password policy how to bring in people one by one so we are all going through a learning experience financial transactions also uh, are now being more and more dependent on the multi factor authentication because this work from home the biggest problem has been the uh, the identity you see earlier there was a perimeter and enterprises were behind a perimeter and you had your anti apt ids ips behavior analytics everything behind a very secure firewall now everyone is operating from their homes you are not sure of their identity you are not sure of their endpoint equipment you are not sure of their home network you are not sure of the network from which from their home it is coming to the enterprise the vpn aggregator the cloud services that they are using the apps that they are using the antivirus etc that they have on the phone so the entire system has become distributed so a new type of cyber security architecture is now required for this now uh, you said whether we have a choice between technology or user behavior i would like to say both in fact that classic case of people process and technology still holds good in the field of cyber security people are also very important and uh, for those who recall the seven layer osi model of communications i have always been saying there is something called the eighth layer it's called the newman's eighth layer and that is the layer that is inside and between our two layer two ears see unless the human being is conscious of security and serious about security the rest of it we can only help him but uh, as we go along uh, this is where we seek the help of technology that in india there is a large base that is in the rural areas you know almost 65% of our population stays in the rural areas those are the people that need technology and i would request all those listening who are uh, in this field to consider that uh, i think i'll take a pause at the moment jenny yes thank you thank you thank you for all of that and actually a sort of a quick update on what's happening in india as well thank you very much for that and i think um um i'm going to ask mr ko sort of just wanting to hear from another government perspective within the region what is your agency's prime focus uh based on your experience and is the user behavior more of a problem now than before i first of all i just want to say that uh, i totally agree with um, everything that general pant uh, said about uh, uh this being not just a technology issue and similarly not just a human factor issue it is both you can't uh, deal with one without uh, uh, considering the other i i think cyber is firstly um, a complex issue um, first of all um, there's no such thing as um, absolute cyber security uh, the only secure computer is the one that's still in the box the moment you take it out and you start to use it you're taking on risk so cyber security is a firstly fundamentally you need to balance what i call the iron triangle which is usability uh, security and cost so you have to balance this and uh, the technology changes the attack surface changes as what uh, mihoko said we had to adapt to the covid-19 situation abruptly so there has been a step change and many of us uh, firstly uh, from a technological perspective were not ready as what uh, general pan said uh, we we have now had to adapt uh, things are no longer inside a nice perimeter we have to now uh, deal with uh, unknown um, identities uh, but the bigger issue is that besides balancing usability security and cost we have to deal with the human dimension i would like to highlight that uh, this is a huge challenge and not just in the rural areas singapore is a totally cosmopolitan city but still you have huge challenges with respect to um, the human dimension and the reason i would argue for this is because we do not have 
the instincts for cybersecurity. Look at, um, let's take for example, the physical domain. All of us understand intuitively that we need to be cautious. We lock our doors when we leave the homes. We lock our cars when we've parked. And uh, we know not to leave our wallets uh, 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 on the table, for example. Uh, and we walk, we instinctively uh, are a bit more careful in a dark street. How do we learn all this? We didn't attend some course by the police, but instinctively as we were growing up, our parents taught us these instincts for physical security. The same is not true for cybersecurity. Our parents didn't teach us the instincts for cybersecurity. So in fact, many of us are teaching our parents about cybersecurity fundamentals. Yeah. Instead, all of us have been thrust into the 21st century without building up these instincts for cybersecurity. So what we instinctively want to do, what we think is natural, are probably the wrong things for cybersecurity. So this is a huge challenge, uh, not just in the rural areas, not just everywhere, I would say. And the human dimension has to be um, something that we focus on. Totally agree. Uh, within Singapore, our government has reached out, same as what um, has been done in India, uh, with advisories, uh, uh, both reaching out to big enterprises, companies, uh, because suddenly they've had to adapt to this uh, e-commerce uh, environment, as well as to individuals, because suddenly you have to work from home, you have to um, uh, manage. Firstly, you've got to manage the cybersecurity settings. Secondly, you have to manage your own uh, bandwidth. Uh, so advisories going out uh, and to the extent possible, also helping people uh, face to face, because I think uh, sending advisories is one thing if you already have basic digital literacy. But we have found that uh, for certain parts of our population, um, the older, the people who perhaps may be less comfortable in the English language, for example, then we've had to have digital ambassadors go out and engage them on a face to face basis uh, with, um, of course, uh, safe distancing and uh, uh, COVID-19 precautions in place. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Ko. Um, I'm, I'm going to just circle back to Eugene, um, wondering, Eugene, if you have anything to add, and perhaps from the point of view of a cybersecurity expert, what, in your view, are the key risks in cyberspace that we need to address for greater cyber resilience and security? Um, and I have one question also from the audience that is for Eugene. Maybe I'll ask it and you can maybe talk about it all together. And the question is, how does one really highlight the importance of cyber hygiene to individuals and companies? If even after such massive scale attacks, they still remain naive to the threats. Over to yeah, you, Eugene. Yeah. OK, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for these questions. Uh, and uh, um, that was uh, uh, then the general and David was speaking about the cybersecurity issues. Uh, as all, um, I was always trying to interrupt them uh, because uh, when they speak about cybersecurity, we're mostly thinking about individual security or enterprise business security. Uh, but what about their uh, industrial security? What about their automatic production system? What about the power plants, power grid? about all that stuff. Uh, well, this is one of the key issue uh, that when we, many people, even cybersecurity experts, when they speak and they think about cybersecurity, they simply forget about Internet of Things. They forget about the industrial uh, issues. Uh, but that is one of the most important uh, the parts of our world. Well, actually, uh, what happens if the power, power grid has a problem? What happens if there is a blackout by which is uh, the, the result of the cyber attack. Actually, this is the end of our civilization. Come on, nothing works. Yeah. Well, well, till the, the generators, uh, they, uh, they, they have some diesel, uh, the world is still online, but then out, nothing works. Uh, so this is one of the key issue. Uh, and this is, this is the key problems. Uh, and uh, well, actually, this uh, I think that this is one of the, the must be one of the main focus of the cybersecurity industry, uh, how to develop and how to uh, provide their true cybersecurity for the critical infrastructure, for the urban facilities, for the healthcare. Uh, I'm speaking about this uh, simply because. Uh, to provide the individual cybersecurity. That's simple, actually. Uh, the individual hygiene, yes, that's a problem. And thank you for the second part of the question. Uh, yes, of course, the, the uh, people are still people, we're individuals. 
and uh, their cyberspace is getting more and more complicated. Uh, I, I just want to say again that we simply don't understand how many cyber devices, cyber systems are around us. Dozens, hundreds. Uh, we simply don't see them. We don't understand them. Uh, and uh, Valesha, it's a, uh, living in the cyberspace, uh, the individual security, individual behavior, it's a all time learning because uh, we are living in the world which is rapidly changing. The new innovations, new technologies, new services, uh, and all these new systems, they are not just, uh, it's not just uh, good, they not just enjoy that, uh, not just use that, but in many cases, there's also the risk, the risk of security. Uh, so we have to learn all the time. Uh, and actually, that's not, not, not easy, that's not simple. Uh, this is the second, actually, the second problem which uh, I see uh, that uh, we need to learn more and more and more, which is not easy. Uh, and actually, there are not many teachers <laughs> which are able to, to teach people about these new systems, new, new technologies, new services, and uh, the, the problems there. Uh, and the third issue, uh, I'm afraid uh, that's uh, uh, international cooperation. Uh, especially during this, this um, the geopolitical situation, which actually also influenced the cybersecurity, the cooperation between countries about cybersecurity, the cooperation between cyber uh, cyber uh, departments of the police, national police forces, uh, to cooperate, how to find, how to locate the bad guys in the cyberspace. Uh, actually, this is also a very serious issue. And in the past, it was going slowly moving in the right direction. It was getting better and better and better, but then it was collapsed, almost collapsed, uh, as I see it from, from my side. So this is also the key issue. Uh, so actually the cybersecurity have to build their perfect world with a safe and secure uh, in terms of cyberspace. Uh, we have to do many, many things. Uh, and actually it's not just one simple answer how to do that. Uh, so it's uh, not just triangle, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, David, maybe it's more complicated, uh, but actually it's possible. So that's uh, not just. I just go. I don't want to say that's uh, mission impossible. It's possible. Uh, we simply need to work more on that and work on the different levels: uh, education, technologies, uh, build a more trusted world, uh, the global world. Uh, so there are many things which we need to do, and I'm optimistic actually we can do it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and precisely after hearing from Eugene, um, I'm reminded to just let all the speakers know, if you have a burning comment to make, please feel free to interrupt. <laughs> because I think it's, it's really a dialogue and multi-stakeholder one, which is really great. Um, and with that, I think um, we are only one third way and we've heard so much and gleaned so many important points. So we've covered risks quite a fair bit hearing from private sector, cyber security expert and government perspective. It's a good time for us to now call up the second Jeannie, poll. Yeah. Sorry, Jeannie, before you go there, could I just uh, jump in and uh, please, uh, please do. Um, I do have a burning response to what uh, Eugene <laughs> said. First of all, I totally agree. It's not just about IT security. It's OT as well, uh, ICS and IoT, totally agreed. And uh, where OT and IoT will have real world uh, impact. Uh, IT only uh, affects the computer, but OT, you have power stations, you have um, mm. uh, generators, you have train systems, etc. cetera. I, I also want to bring up a point uh, that someone told me that uh, cybersecurity has similarities to piracy on the high seas. Um, the, Pirates in the past uh, uh, struck at our cargo ships, etc. And some of the pi and why did they do so? Because of um, the lure for financial gain. They were after the treasure, etc. So the pirates today, the cybersecurity criminals are doing the same thing. And some of the pirates of old also had um, uh, co were co-opted by countries. So they worked for the navies. Uh, as it were. So again, we're seeing similar kinds of behavior in cyberspace um, uh, uh, for cyber threat actors as well. Second, on the high seas, you see the cargo ships traveling. And today, this is like the data that is traveling uh, on cyberspace. So this is the treasure that they're after, firstly for financial gain, but secondly, also for strategic uh, interests. 
Um, and thirdly, piracy was not just a security issue. It was a confluence of, besides security, also trade, economic and national security issues. And again, we see similar trends in cybersecurity. As what Eugene talked about, it's not just a technical issue. It's not just a security issue. It's geopolitics, it's technology, and we are wrapped up in all of this. And as Eugene said exactly, it is not something that any one country can do by itself. Even within the country, the government can't do it by ourselves. We need cooperation. We need cooperation in multiple dimensions. Within the country, the country, the, the government has to work with industry, with the people sector, with academia. And definitely, because cyber doesn't respect borders, we have to have international cooperation. Um, it, it, the attacks are not just coming from the neighboring country, they're coming from all around the world. So we need international cooperation. So I totally agree with what uh, Eugene said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ko. Um, more on, I'm, I'm placing a, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a placeholder on public-private partnership because I'm starting to hear that from our speakers. Um, but I think we have a, we have some space to discuss that in the next segment. Um, for now, I will like to jump into our second poll question and get more audience participation. Again, for those who have joined us not long, um, please go to www.menti.com and key in 42-42-23-9 as the code and the question to vote on is what poses challenges in addressing risks in cyberspace? Um, we live in a world with many options and so we also have given you five options. Uh, lack of dialogue and sorry, insufficient information sharing, lack of dialogue and trust, rapid developing, rapidly developing technologies and slow policy instruments, weak security of applications and technologies, as well as lack of experts. So the question is, what poses challenges in addressing risks in cyberspace? We'll give it a minute or so for the votes to come in. We are already seeing more interesting questions which are being typed into the questions pane. Um, we will have them addressed in the panel discussion to follow right after this poll question is addressed. Yeah. Thank you everyone. The votes are coming in. Vote, vote, vote at the website address provided and key in the code and we will be on it. So actually, from what I see of the poll question that we have posed, um, whichever answer was picked, with the exception of maybe lack of dialogue and trust, uh, most of them stem from the root challenge of a lack of resource and capacity. So I'm going to ask my next question, or rather ask the next question, um, perhaps to Mihoko first. Okay, right. I think, Mihoko, can I ask you this question? Do we have enough resources and capacity for research, analysis, and development to ensure that Infocom technologies and cyberspace serve people's well being? Mihoko. Sure. Uh, so thank you for your question. So I would say that now I have we, we have uh, a lot of resources to invest in uh, helping uh, small and medium sized companies, and especially during the pandemic, and also for the resources for the remote workers uh, during the pandemic. And let me explain. So um, 
So even before the pandemic started, 17% uh, of cyber attacks have targeted on small and medium sized companies. Why? Because bad guys knew that those small uh, companies do not have resources to invest in cybersecurity. And in fact, in Japan, over 52% of small and medium sized companies would never imagine that they would be targeted by cyber attacks because they say, well, we are small, we are not important enough to be targeted, but they are so wrong. But the good news is that um, there are help from uh, government, academia, and the industry to help out on small and medium sized companies. So, uh, for instance, uh, last year, the Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry started to work with Japanese IT, cybersecurity, and insurance companies together to launch uh, pilot programs to offer free cybersecurity services for uh, small and medium sized companies. And in addition to that, uh, big Japanese companies, including NTT, started to work with local chambers of commerce. To, to provide uh, cybersecurity workshops specifically targeted for small and medium sized companies. Because again, small companies do not have resources and budget to invest in cybersecurity. So the, it must be really basic and it must be like only for the cyber hygiene. As uh, Mr. David Ko uh, emphasized that one size fit all uh, approach would not work for cybersecurity. So we have to change our approaches to target different types of audience for cybersecurity. And another problem, especially during the pandemic, is unfortunately cyber espionage and disruptions such as ransomware attacks, especially against um, medical research institutions or hospitals. And but I, I see some uh, good news about this program because there are so many uh, government, academia, and cybersecurity professionals have launched uh, voluntary uh, coalitions to tackle with uh, cyber attacks. So, for example, the COVID 19 Cyber Threat Coalition or Cyber Threat Intelligence League to provide a free cybersecurity uh, intelligence and also services. And there are some uh, uh, enterprises to provide free cybersecurity services to tackle with cyber attacks against uh, medical institutions. So I really appreciate uh, the, those kinds of uh, supports and I really appreciate the, the advisories from our CSA because it's very helpful, not for the big enterprises, but also for remote workers, uh, individuals. All right, and I just want to pick up on that interesting point you made about NTT and other major Japanese companies working together to provide SMBs in Japan with cybersecurity training, etc. Eugene, Eugene, um, is there anything being done at Kaspersky for the wider community in this or any other regard? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, actually, there are so many things were done uh, to uh, to help the community to survive during the, this uh, this very hard time. Uh, there are first of all, of course, uh, it was about the healthcare uh, industry, so we provided our products for free uh, for all uh, medical institutions. Uh, actually, uh, I have the numbers, but uh, they are. I need to check it. Okay, so I have the yes, I have numbers. Uh, so uh, the help was received by uh, about 2,000 of healthcare institutions. Uh, we gave uh, about 300,000 licenses uh, from almost 50 countries. Uh, so actually, that's that was the obvious things to do. Uh, and uh, when then we uh, helped uh, the businesses, the uh, small businesses in uh, different countries in a little bit different way, uh, how to how to survive uh, uh, during this uh, very hard time. Uh, and we did many other things, uh, even very unusual. Uh, and um, for example, we uh, we started the the tourism uh, accelerator the, for the tourist companies because they are also very uh, badly impacted by this uh, crisis. And also, we are uh, we recognize that some of our new technologies they're exactly what the the, uh, the world needs. Uh, for example, we were just um, on time to release uh, the online election system, so online voting. Uh, so actually, it's a blockchain-based system, so it's protected by blockchain. 
it guarantees uh, their privacy, it guarantees security, it guarantees that the results that can be uh, damaged, that they can be hacked. Uh, so actually this system which is uh, really needs in the times of the, the global pandemic. Uh, so actually I think that many other companies uh, in security sector, uh, in cybersecurity and in other sectors, they also helped others uh, to survive uh, during this very hard time. Um, well, uh, but well, actually, I'm optimistic. I, I, I'm absolutely sure that very soon the world will get back to normal <laughs> and we will travel again. <laughs> uh, and so uh, actually the, the difference, well, actually the world will be the same uh, with one minor difference. We learn online. So there will be much more online services. There will be more online meetings. And actually, I see that maybe uh, maybe we will need to work twice more uh, because we will get back to normal, to normal meetings, uh, to conferences and having online as well. So plus to our usual activities, we'll have online activities. Uh, and actually that's, uh, the example is we have a Security Analyst Summit conference, SAS conference, which last, uh, last year we, were, we had it in Singapore. And unfortunately this year it was canceled in Barcelona. Uh, well, postponed, and it seems that it will be cancelled. Uh, but they have online instead, and we decided that later next year we'll have the true, their traditional, their real conference and online conference. So our conference team will work twice more. <laughs> so I guess many of us will work twice more back to normal life and plus virtual, virtual life. Uh, it's also. Uh, the change in uh, in the industries, the other industries. For example, uh, there is more demand on remote management for infrastructure, for uh, production systems, for critical infrastructure, because they need people to manage them, to manage and to fix that, to operate that remotely. And actually, it's all a challenge for the cybersecurity. How to guarantee the hundred percent secure way? to manage critical infrastructure. How to do it? Actually, we are working on that as well. Uh, and actually, this uh, this is very hard time of the COVID pandemic. It's also the challenge for cybersecurity to create new ideas, uh, to generate, to, 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 uh, to develop and introduce new products, new services. Uh, so actually, well, when the world will get back to normal, we'll look back into the past and see hmm, that were quite interesting time mm -hmm. which really changed the world and which, which make the world better. Mm, I hope so. I'm optimistic. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I, I thank you, Eugene. I share your optimism and I think um, it is important to be optimistic so that we can all move forward in a more positive manner um, and never feel too dragged down by the COVID-19 or whatever pandemic there may be. Um, on that note, I thought while we're still on the topic of challenges, um, to my mind, and I'm going to call on General Pan on this next question on resources and capacity, um, because when dealing with any risks, um, resources and one of the key challenges would be resources and capacity, which tend to be scarce. Um, in most governments, they have very many competing priorities when running a country. So how does the government of India challenge, handle the challenges of balancing these competing priorities? General Pant, any? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Jenny. And uh, let me take off from where Eugene left off about uh, the critical infrastructure. You see, that, that is a very important subject in itself. Firstly, there is a private sector also involved in the critical information infrastructure. Uh, say power is not only the government companies that are doing it, it's the private companies also. And same goes for you know the other transportation, etc. So uh, and also what is critical infrastructure is different for different countries depending upon their national interests. On the lighter side, let me tell you that in Netherlands, the Heineken beer factory is a critical infrastructure. <laughs> and uh, last year when we went to uh, Cyber Week in Israel, there was a country from Europe 
which said that uh, protection of heritage uh, heritage monuments was a critical infrastructure uh, this thing for them so anyway like we've got six in india us has, uh, usa has got 14 verticals etc so in fact the discussion going on today is is there anything which is non critical is water non critical you know what happened in israel recently between israel and iran and we all uh, hear the same news so that is that is the first uh, point of discussion as to what is not critical and what uh, the pandemic has shown us with everything becoming online and more automation in the future uh, there is a problem there that do you defend all your assets uh, with the same amount of seriousness as what we had originally planned to defend the critical information infrastructure so this this is one of the challenges as to uh, from the government point of view as to now how to balance your resources with those key sectors in protecting those key sectors that you consider as critical the second challenge i find is uh, of resources uh, presently in the pandemic in order to meet the requirement i require every sector to have a security operation center i need a sock everywhere right now uh, where is the manpower for that sock because initially when the pandemic broke uh, people were told to stay in lockdown so we said okay some people are essential services and they need to go but it could be 100% we couldn't go there physically so 30 50% or something people went there so that was a real challenge as to now how to man the socks because uh, with the online and the distributed architecture that i mentioned in my uh, previous session uh, this, this was very much required so the challenge now is how to go in for the new types of the uh, security incident and event management structures your uh, security orchestration and automation response structures uh, and how to implement them in the sheer scale and size of india that i spoke of and we have 29 states in the country and each one of them is as big as the uk and uh, you can imagine the layers of socks of socks that has to go into the structure so that is that is one of our uh, challenges the final challenge that i wish to highlight is the lack of attribution and i think eugene probably referred to it when he was talking of international collaboration uh, because the way the attacks are coming with uh, four or five hops and the breaking down of our legal system if i may say the international legal system we've tried uh, the mlat the mutual legal assistance treaty that doesn't seem to be working we've tried the letter of rogatory the judicial route that also is taking a long time the only thing that is left is bilateral relations we have various regional forums international forums uh, you are aware what has happened in the ungg last time and uh, you know fault lines that are widening so that is, that is to me at, at at the level at which i am placed it it is a bit disheartening that uh, in order to attribute we definitely need international collaboration so now that that is uh, uh, what i would uh, say at this point is is also one of my biggest challenges i, I i'll rest my case there thank you thank you general khan any burning comments from any other speakers just checking <laughs> otherwise i have a question from the audience which i think i should ask on behalf at this point in time the question is um if there are risks if there are risks to cyber space and if, um, sorry, it's not, okay. Are we going to have more fractured cyber space in the post COVID era? Are we going to have a more fractured cyber space post COVID? Um, any, any speaker, please be my guest. Um, well, I just now uh, probably referred to it uh, in a sense. Yes that uh, firstly we are all waiting for the post covid era to start <laughs> <laughs> hoping so, yeah the <laughs> vaccine and you know what is going to happen after that but uh, having said that what we have seen uh, in the globalized world order is that there is a sense of uh, you know people falling back to their national interests because it is basically the nations which are today doing everything and all of them are doing an excellent job in uh, treating this pandemic. So there is a sense of deglobalization that is taking place, if I may use that word, although I don't like it, but uh, as of now, this is what is happening. 
and this is likely to affect the fractured if you uh, are talking of that uh, cyberspace for some time to come but then we have to fall back and i'm sure that the uh, major countries and the major uh, regional uh, forums etc the moment they realize that there is in uh, cyberspace as uh, david co also said no borders and we have to align ourselves uh, i think it's it's just a the short period of time we will definitely feel the pinch but then we will go back as ejun said to the new normal yeah if i can uh, just uh, continue the conversation i i just build on what general pant has said totally agree um i feel that there is a very strong need for us to develop a rules based international order for cyberspace just like we have in the physical domains for land sea and air and also in a uh, world trade for example so we need a rules based order to ensure that there are clear rules of the road which will then govern the behavior um for in cyberspace so that uh, we can continue to transact ideas economic growth uh, business etc uh, we do need to work together um how can this be done um well i think that firstly there is a need to uh, uh, build up trust uh, you need to have um, dialogue uh, and international cooperation now this then becomes the basis for the digital economy you talk about the post covid uh, world the post covid world will be a digital world it is already uh, uh, we we we've been thrust into this direction i don't think we're going to go back so if we are going to be reliant on the digital infrastructure then there has to be rules of the road uh, we have talked about um, the gge the group of governmental experts uh, there is another uh, process as well the open ended uh, working group both of these processes are happening at the united nations and their attempts to try to to build on this dialogue to create this uh, international rules based order for cyberspace um singapore believes that there is an important role for the united nations to play in this because the united nations is where um all countries big and small can have a voice um there was a question i saw on the chat which talked about regional groupings uh, what can asean for example uh, do let me speak a little bit about this but also to caveat this so in asean uh, we've had uh, as part of the singapore international cyber week an asean ministerial conference on cybersecurity so we've managed to elevate the conversation from one of a technical domain to have the ministers uh, talk about it and recognize the importance of cybersecurity not from a security perspective but as a key enabler for economic growth for the digital economy and the asean ministers have um, supported the 11 uh, norms of uh, responsible state behavior from the 2015 UNGG report we think this is an essential uh, first step forward uh, one of the key roles we see that regional groupings can do is to build capacity uh, general pan talked about uh, resources and capacity i think that one of the issues about capacity is that uh, different countries have different technical operational capability so an area like asean we find that uh, it is logical for us to band together and uh, help to address some of the capacity issues but we should not end up having a block so that you end up with an asean uh, internet that is a uh, non starter in my view the internet is global and there is an important for us to make sure there's interoperability at the global level and this has to be underscored by cybersecurity and an international rules based order thank you uh, let let me have a let me have a sorry to interrupt let me have the short remark about the international cooperation and this time i'll be a little bit negative and pessimistic or maybe not not optimistic as well uh so Uh, it's absolutely right that the global international cooperation it's it, it, it's a must it's necessary uh, and so the first time there were uh, such a convention and agreement of the international cooperation that was a budapest cyber crime convention in 2001 uh 20 years after well actually it doesn't really work uh, so in 2001 was the first time there was signed the agreement about the cooperation in cyberspace against cyber crime 10 years after 2011 London Cyberspace Conference and it was an international meeting and the government representatives from many countries around the world the ministers the prime ministers everyone was speaking about cyber crime and the importance of the cooperation what happened nothing so next year it will be 10 years after the London Cyberspace Conference i think that 
the third time there must be some successful event and finally we'll have some kind of the working agreement on the international level the global kind of the cooperation uh, so i hope that the next year after covid then the, all the nations will recognize importance of the cooperation in the cyberspace finally we'll have a working system uh, to help all us to save to live in a more safe and secure cyberspace thank you yes miho miho would like to say something i think Sure. So, so I, I totally agree that you know, we can be very pessimistic to, to look at the current situation of the, the global uh, geopolitical tensions, uh, and I'm, I'm sure that it will, will stay here for a while. But, this is a big but, but you know, there are different levels of global collaboration. So there are political level of collaboration and dialogues, so it can be a little bit difficult at the moment, but there are also economic or digital economy level of collaboration, and we have to embed cybersecurity into digital economy, and everybody will agree with that. And capacity building for developing countries or small, medium-sized companies, we, we agree that it's important, and many countries, including Japan and Singapore, have been helping uh, different countries around the world to, to raise the, the awareness level and changing the behavior of cyber hygiene. So, I can be very pessimistic looking at the certain portion of the global uh, issues, but we should be also optimistic to look at you know, what's happening from the, the, the bright people and bright organizations and the government to help to, to raise the cybersecurity awareness level in the world. Okay. Okay, very good. I think this is a very robust discussion. And also personality-wise, I think we're very balanced, a fair amount of optimism and some not so <laughs> in different aspects as well. I'm mindful of the time. We have about 12 minutes left together. So I'm going to dive right into the last segment, which is on solutions to meet the challenges um, and, of course, to promote security and stability in cyberspace. Um, Perhaps um, Eugene can help me with this next question, which is what are the key directions and priorities to make cyberspace more trusted and secure? Uh, yes, and uh, actually, um, uh, in short, uh, I will try to be as short as possible. So first of all, it's the technologies, technologies and products uh, to protect not just individuals, uh, businesses and industrial systems, but also to provide a new uh, immunity concept, the, the, uh, the, the uh, design of the systems which don't need the security, <laughs> which are unhackable. Uh, so actually it's uh, two directions, uh, to secure the existing system and to build the new systems based on a new architecture, on the new ideas, uh, the system which don't need so much of security. Uh, second, education and trainings. Uh, we need more. It's not just education, not just trainings for individuals, for people, uh, also for uh, experts. We need more. <clears throat> we need more cybersecurity experts, and uh, we have. It must start from there. Uh, this is kind of education from the schools. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, many nations they still have a lack of the uh, education abilities. Uh, when uh, when I when I speak to our other nations and I say that okay, so the, in in Russia the kids on the from the very early uh, years in the school they study computer systems, they study program languages. They don't believe me. Okay, so one of my kids is nine years old now, uh, third year in the school. He is uh, studying the program languages, studying Python right now. Yes, it works. Uh, third. Uh, international cooperation fighting was it's uh, two things actually international cooperation the regulation uh, which you really need uh, and uh, second the cooperation to fight with the bad guys in the cyberspace and actually our experience is if we really need we can find almost every bad guy in the cyberspace because they are not perfect they do mistakes they leave the finger cyber fingerprints it's possible to find almost every bad guy but we need to have a very strong cooperation. Well, the, the last example was which uh, with the cyber police, and as far as I know, with Interpol, uh, we rescued one of the hospitals in Latin America, actually, from, it was, they were victims of the ransom attack, and we actually we helped them. Uh, so actually, it's possible. This mission is possible. Uh, so, well, in short, technologies, education, international cooperation, and regulation. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Um, and I hear from Eugene about education and, you know, sort of, sort of a different spin to it is awareness raising as well um, and educating the public. And there's actually a lot we can go on about cyberspace behavior being one of the weakest link of cybersecurity as well. So now I'm really curious to hear what a regulator's point of view might be in terms of what governs behavior in cyberspace and whether there are any upstream problems which are being solved. Um, Mr. Ko and General Pant, either of you, please, the floor is yours, if you could maybe help me with that question. Thank you, uh, Mr. David. See, the situation is very clear. Number one priority is your personal hygiene. Number two priority is cyber hygiene, period. <laughs> if you want to survive in this COVID and post-COVID era, we have to understand that, in fact, the other day I went to one of our famous, uh, you know, television broadcasters, because in India, some years back, we carried out a polio program. You know, we have been able to eradicate polio and the, one of the reasons for that was that in every movie show, in every television serial, there used to be a broadcast of giving those two drops to the children. It, it was a massive campaign. So my aim of going to him, this chairperson of this broadcasting house was that, let us now have a massive plan for cyber security awareness on the same scale as that, because the issue has become a, very important and all of us, uh, are in this business. We are seeing the cyber crime that is taking place. I feel so bad when, you know, widowers, pensioners are targeted and their hard earned money is taken out by SMS and wishing and all those campaigns that are taking place by these frauds, uh, you know. So th this has to be tackled. This, this is this is very important. So uh, what Eugene says, I totally go along with him, education and awareness. In addition, as I said earlier, the AI ML and the behavior analysis part has to be used to help those who are not so tech savvy. Why should, uh, if I am in New Delhi, why should my uh, money be taken out in a bank in uh, Singapore? I mean, uh, as an example. So there have to be, you know, multi-factor sort of checks in terms of your behavior as to how much money we've been withdrawing at, at an average, your location, besides your, you know, biometrics, etc. So these, these are the solutions that we have to now work in. And finally, there has to be monitoring at the enterprise level, whether it is for IT and OT before Eugene checks me. There has to be a monitoring of uh, uh, whether people are doing what they are expected to do. Are they using the apps for the time that they are expected to use that app and any abnormalities? That is again a place where technology comes in. So all this now has to be done on a very serious scale. Uh, and finally, uh, as to how do we carry out the tele audit with uh, in the distributed system that I spoke of earlier, how is the tele cyber audit expected to be carried out? How, how do I get the image of that disk in order to uh, uh, do the forensics and whether that will be acceptable in a court of law? So this is another field which we have not spoken of, but which has to be uh, tackled. And I think these are some of the major solutions. Thank you. And there is actually, um, uh, if, if I may, there's a question from the floor. And maybe this is this one Mr. Ko can take. What role can academia and technologists play in building up a nation's cybersecurity and how can governments work with them? Mr. Ko, please. Excellent. All right. Let me just build on the conversation, what Eugene said, what General Pan said. So I think the first thing, and, and what uh, you asked as well, uh, Jeannie, and this question, um, what can a regulator or what should the regulators uh, do? Well, the first thing that I think we need to do is we need to move it upstream. We need to make it simple. Um, it needs to be, the, the technology now is too complex, too difficult. We are asking everybody, every SME, like what Mihoko said, to be responsible for their own cybersecurity. This is impossible. I, I think it has to be uh, made simple so that everyone, the man in the street, the widower, the pensioner, the SME, can be able to take care of his own cyber hygiene. We needs to be not security by design, but security by default. We need to put in place uh, regulations so that the internet service providers, the telcos are uh, doing things upstream so that at the consumer end, um, it now becomes a cleaner internet pipe. The analogy I would use is water. 
it's now analogous to every SME, every in enterprise, every individual trying to dig his own well and make sure that his water is pure and uh, trying to purify his own water. Wouldn't it be much simpler if we have a central uh, water agency which is purifying the water and then all of us just turn on the tap and we get clean water to begin with. From a national regulator's perspective, we think that moves in this direction where we move upstream, we make it security by default, simplify it for the consumer and the SME, like what Mihoko was saying, I think these are the steps that we need to do. One example that we have done in Singapore is to introduce a cybersecurity labeling scheme. Right now, it's too difficult. Individual consumers don't know which product to buy. And when you look at the product, what are, what are your main considerations? Uh, the price, the functionality, maybe the color. No one is asking what are the cybersecurity attributes of the router, the internet, uh, your, your baby monitor. So we are trying to introduce this uh, in Singapore where at the very simple thing, just one tick, two ticks, three ticks, then at the consumer level, you can choose the one which has more ticks, just like uh, electricity consumption. So this is an example. The second area, I agree wholeheartedly with what uh, Eugene said, education, um, public outreach, like what General Pant uh, says. I think we need to, all of us are not digital natives. We are emigres. We speak the digital language, but with an accent. Uh, our children, are digital natives. I hope that the next generation will have the instincts that we talked about. Uh, we need to go up to the schools. We need to do this. I, I'm uh, inspired by the story that General Pant uh, shared. I have a similar story in Singapore. When I was young, uh, we were a third world nation. And uh, when I went to school, they gave us a mug and a toothbrush. And during recess, the teacher made us squat by the drain and we all learned to brush our teeth. To my knowledge, the teacher was not an oral hygienist but she just taught us this is what you need to do. So we brought it back, we showed our parents, and then in the space of a generation, we learned personal hygiene. I think we need to do something similar for cyber hygiene. The third thing that I want to talk about is partnership. We need to have partnerships, private, public partnerships, international partnerships, regional partnerships. Partnerships to deal with the bad guys, like what Eugene talked about. Partnerships talk about capacity building, like what Mihoko talked about and the rules of international uh, behavior. On the question that uh, you talked about, um, Jeannie, about, uh, from the floor, about what can academia do? I'm clear that government can't deal with cybersecurity by itself. We need to partner with industry and we need to partner with academia. In Singapore, we have uh, actually got uh, two major projects that we have with academia. One is our R&D uh, program where we have the institutes of higher learning and we work uh, very closely with them. Uh, the second is that we have a call for innovation where we also work with um, academia and with industry R&D providers to bridge that gap from R&D into innovation, into products. So these are examples uh, in Singapore of what we are doing uh, in terms of uh, partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ko. I just want to uh, make sure that I get one more question from the floor answered. Um, and I'm going to post this to Mihoko. The, uh, the question is to develop security by design and by default. Are there needs to be more standardized in terms of regulations and strategies and eff efforts to develop this, for example, in ASEAN? So to develop security by design and by default, are there needs to be more standardized regulations and strategies? Um, so, as uh, Mr. David Koch already pointed out about this issue, uh, I, I do not think it, it's a good idea to, to impose uh, uh, regulations on a specific each uh, region. The reason why is that even though we say ASEAN or Europe or Americas, they are so diverse, right? E each country has a different languages and then each country has different uh, sectors and industries and they speak in different languages. So if we try to impose on one specific regulations to, to, to try to uh, take a one size fit all for everybody, it doesn't really work. So I, I, I and also because it takes years to make regulations. So I, I think well, it's, it's important to have regulations to incentivize the, the companies or peoples to, to implement a good cybersecurity uh, tactics. 
But at the same time, we shouldn't stop ourselves from educating the leadership of companies or the government to make sure that cybersecurity is embedded in business operations or the, the protection of critical infrastructure. Because as everybody said during this conversation, we use IT more and more during this pandemic. So cybersecurity has to be everybody, everywhere and for everybody. And so we, we have to change our mindset, but especially the, the mindset of enterprise uh, CEOs, uh, Swiss leads, and also the government leadership to make sure that it is happening. Thank you for that. Um, it is now time for me to ask a lightning round of quick responses from our four speakers for one last question as conclusion. Um, if you could tell me, make a tweet in Twitter. Just a quick line response, one one liner. What makes cyber resilience possible? What makes cyber resilience possible? What would you tweet? General Pant. A tweet like, uh, make cybersecurity great again? <laughs> okay, no, but let me, uh, let me give the official reply. Uh, Cyber resilience is our ability to respond, manage, and recover from a cyber attack. We must continuously enhance our processes, capability, and capacity to enable the same. Thank you. I quite like your first tweet, though. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ko, on to you. Thanks so much. I also like General Pan's uh, first tweet. Uh, Cyber threats in the digital space are akin to piracy on the open sea. Like the crew on a ship, we need to work together to ensure the right balance between security, usability and cost. The same way that a ship needs to protect its precious cargo, in our case, our cargo is data and privacy as we move en route to our destination in cyberspace. Cybersecurity is a team sport. Okay, thank you. That was a very long tweet. <laughs> on, to <our laughs> next, on to our next guest, Mihoko, what would your tweet be? So the pandemic actually gave us a great opportunity to collaborate because we don't have to travel now physically to, to each other, to the other countries. We can collaborate online to talk to each other and on this kind of uh, WebEx or Zoom meetings. So uh, I think that uh, this kind of uh, digital era during the pandemic should be uh, advanced to, to make sure that we can incorporate uh, everybody's expertise and insights into the better cybersecurity environment. That, that may be more than 280 characters, I think. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I'm okay. guessing. Um, Eugene. <laughs> Eugene for uh, the tweet. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. Uh, well, actually, it's very hard to beat uh, General Pant uh, um, <laughs> cybersecurity great again. It's very hard, but I will try. Uh, okay, so we are living in a COVID uh, pandemic time and we are waiting for the vaccine available uh, to make the just injection and you are safe. Uh, well, actually, this is the, uh, the, uh, the vaccine which was just the, in the news from Russia. They have two times, they have uh, two months and again. Uh, well, doesn't matter. So I, I, my dream is, my dream is uh, actually to have some kind of the cyber, cyber vaccine. Uh, and uh, it's not just once because, like in a, uh, with a biological diseases, there are many different vaccines, but it's a list of the vaccines which is regulated by governments. Correct? Yes. So the list of the cyber immunity vaccines which is uh, regulated by government, maybe depending on the regions, maybe dependent on the, the, the size of businesses, different for individuals, different for the critical infrastructure. But anyway, the list of the things which we need to do to make the world immune from the cyber threats. Thank you. Good. Thank you. That was a tweet on cyber immunity. I'm sorry, everyone, we have had more questions than we have time for. Uh, but we must bring our forum to a close. I hope you found our Asia Pacific 
online policy forum useful this is our very first event it's been very encouraging all the support that we're getting from you after this event you will receive an email from us with a link to access the recording of today's forum if there are any other questions that you, burning questions you feel please feel free to reach out and please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists today who have shared very frank very useful insights thank you very much dr rajesh pant general pant mr david ko Ms. Mihoko Matsubara, and of course, Mr. Eugene Kaspersky. It's been a great pleasure moderating today's forum for you. My name is Jeannie, Head of Government Relations Asia Pacific at Kaspersky, and I hope to see you all again at our future events. Signing off now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.